It is now time for question period. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, kindly Speaker. Speaker, before I begin my first question to the Premier, I do want to acknowledge that today is PSW Day, and I can't imagine any other group more deserving of our praise and our thanks today. So happy PSW Day to all of those frontline workers. Speaker, the crisis in long-term care continues, but the Premier has yet to commit to a public inquiry, to a full, independent public inquiry. Families and frontline workers deserve openness. They deserve transparency and the concrete change that can only come with a full and open public inquiry. A government commission is simply not good enough. If the Premier is truly committed to getting answers and ensuring all voices are heard, why is he refusing to commit to an independent public inquiry? The Premier to reply. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to thank all the PSWs out there for doing an incredible job. They come in day after day and put the community and patients ahead of themselves. So again, thank you. Mr. Speaker, we, we've been clear that we will review the long-term care system once we get through this pandemic. I have said over and over again to the public that we have a broken system, and we're going to get down to the bottom of it. And how we're going to get down to the bottom, bottom of it, Mr. Speaker, to expedite the problems that we have seen, to make sure they get fixed as we're fixing uh, long-term care on a daily basis, we have a broken system. And I'm not going to stand up here and politicize that it's happened under the previous government with the support of the NDP. I'm Response. not going down that road. We have, we have an issue, and together, together, we should all work together to make sure we fix the system. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, families who have lost loved ones, nurses and PSWs who have put their health and safety on the line won't be heard in another backroom process. Yeah. Past public inquiries have been called following a single death. Over 1,300 seniors have died in long-term care. Why does the Premier think they don't deserve a full, independent public inquiry? Premier? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we're going to wait years for an inquiry to return the results. It's very simple. We need to fix it now. Ontario deserves more. The people, the families deserve more and a quicker result. That's why an independent, nonpartisan, and I repeat, nonpartisan commission is the best way to conduct a thorough and ex expedited review. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier will know that the Ontario Command of the Royal Canadian Legion wrote him this week about the crisis in long-term care. In fact, I have a copy of the letter right here, and it can go over to the Premier uh, via a page if, uh, if that's uh, appropriate at this time. Um, and what they say in the letter is that they're concerned about the government's refusal to even respond to previous concerns that they've raised with this government. They've told us veterans are, quote, dehydrated and malnourished, and some have been, quote, left in diapers for days on end. These brave women and men fought for our country. They shouldn't have to be fighting for their lives now that they're in long-term care. They are demanding answers, Speaker. They don't want the Premier to hide behind a backroom government-controlled commission. They deserve a full public inquiry. And so my question to the Premier is, why will he, will he not side with the veterans of the Royal Canadian Legion and call for a complete, full public inquiry? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply for the government. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the, the question. All Ontarians deserve answers to what has transpired, and that's why we are creating an independent commission to address questions surrounding this. Ontarians have, lo have lost. They have losses of their loved ones. Our government is committed to taking every measure possible, using every tool possible. When we look at the public inquiry from the wet lawfer case, Justice Scalise's public inquiry, we were acting on that as soon as we became a Ministry of Long-Term Care last summer. It took two years. 
Time is of the essence. Ontarians deserve to get the care that they need. We cannot lose more time. Our government has been working since the onset to look at staffing, Response. look at capacity, look at wait lists, expert panel for staffing strategy. We have been moving decisively and swiftly because Ontarians deserve it, and that's what we're doing. Thank you very much. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. The reality is that people have been raising the alarm bells on long-term care for years now. The President of the Royal Canadian Legion notes uh, in his letters to the government uh, that he has written many times. He has written on behalf of veterans and has never actually received a reply. Frontline workers in long-term care tell very similar stories, Speaker. They've also been calling for a public inquiry. No one has asked for yet another Ford government-controlled commission. We owe it to the thousands of staff and residents who lost their lives to get to the bottom of this. We owe it to their family members, to their friends, to their communities. We owe it to them, Speaker. If the Premier won't listen to veterans groups, will he listen to health care heroes who put their lives on the line every single day of this crisis Question. and call a full, independent public inquiry? Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Looking across the globe, we've seen COVID-19 impacting our elderly across the country, across the globe. Ontario is no different. When we look at what has transpired in our long-term care homes, it is a tragedy, and we need to address that tragedy. But we cannot lose time. There is a sense of urgency. Our residents in long-term care need the care they need to be looked after. We need to address the staffing. We need to look at capacity. After 15 years, decades of neglect of this sector, here is where we are. Look around. Many of you were here making decisions about long-term care. We need to move forward. And we need to move forward now. We cannot lose time. Response. Years cannot go by before we address the critical issues in long-term care, and that's exactly what we're doing, looking at staffing, looking at capacity. Thank you. Final supplementary. Frontline health workers, veterans, health experts are all calling for a full, independent public inquiry. And so are families who are uh, lost or uh, who are concerned uh, about uh, loved ones uh, that they have lost or who are still working on the front lines. In fact, last week we received a letter from Gord, whose sister-in-law is a PSW working in a long-term care home. He told us that the home his sister works in wasn't just unprepared for the COVID-19 crisis, but that they have no plan to deal with the residents who tested positive uh, and the workers there still don't have access to proper PPE. Gord and his family deserve answers, Speaker. He is joining others in calling for a full public inquiry, not a government-controlled commission. People deserve more than a government-controlled commission. Will the Premier give that to them? Minister of Long-Term Care. Reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. This is a non-partisan, independent Commission, and that is absolutely, absolutely key to keep advancing the reforms that are needed in long-term care. We saw under the previous government a neglect of this sector. Only 611 beds were built between 2011 and 2018. We know that we need to keep moving on long-term care. Our residents deserve it. Their families deserve it. Looking around the world, you can see how families and residents of long-term care have been impacted. An independent commission will provide us the answers that we need in a timely way so we can keep Order. advancing long-term care. We know that there were numerous measures in terms Spons. of PPEs, in terms of testing, that need addressing. And our government has been working across ministries to address those issues. We need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, speaker, I think this is the final in my second question, my final sup. 
Okay, okay that's fine. Apologize. No, no problem. Um, supplementary. But what I do want to do is uh, make sure that the Minister of Long-Term Care has actually read her government's press release, because it speaks specifically to a government-controlled process, government-controlled terms of reference, government-controlled appointees on this commission. That is not public speaker that is not independent that is not transparent the newly formed seniors advocacy advocacy group for seniors social action ontario has also been calling for an independent public inquiry into the high infection and death rates in ontario's long-term care facilities they agree that a government controlled commission just isn't good enough and say and i quote a review like that proposed by the minister of long-term care is not enough and would only serve to keep information from the public and protect the interests of the multinational companies that own many of these homes rather than the interests of the residents that reside in them. Question. Perhaps that's why they're doing a commission. Will the Premier do the right thing, do what seniors are asking for, and agree to a full public inquiry into long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again for the question. This is a non-partisan independent commission. There is too much at stake to wait. The wet law for inquiry went from 2017 and to 2019. Order. Two years. We cannot up Okay. The House will come to order. This House has declared a state of emergency in the province of Ontario. I would expect a certain standard of decorum in question period today. I apologize to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Looking at the years of neglect, the staffing crises, the capacity crises, all of these were contributing factors. We know issues are in the long-term care system. In terms of Justice Galise, she called the system strained. Under COVID-19, it is broken. We do not need to take years and years identifying the issues. Many of the issues are clear, and we need to be acting decisively Response. on those now. Our Ontarians, all Ontarians, deserve it. Residents of long-term care and their families deserve advancement in long-term care. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my next question is to the Premier, but I look forward with, for then the uh, permanent increase in wages for PSWs, sick days, benefits, pensions, full-time jobs. I think those things can be fixed just like that. Let's hope the government does it. Uh, the, the questions to the Premier. Doctors are also raising concerns, Speaker. Dr. Janice Lassard, who specializes in seniors' care, says this, and I quote, the people of Ontario deserve to know the facts about their long-term care system independently from government, as well as make recommendations based on their desires and values for the redesign of a long-term care system that will be part of their own aging in the years to come. Only a public inquiry can do this or can accomplish this, end quote. Will the Premier do the right thing and listen to the doctors, nurses, veterans and families calling for an independent public inquiry into long-term care? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. If we look back over the last 20 years, two decades, what we've seen is societal neglect of long-term care. Governments after government has neglected and ignored the needs of long-term care residents, their staff, and how long-term care can be integrated into the health care system as a whole. We have learned lessons from COVID-19. We have learned how important it is to integrate our long-term care system with the acute care system how our hospital expertise can help our long-term care homes. We've learned how a merciless enemy arrives invisibly in our long-term care homes and how we need testing and PPE and measures increasing to reduce the entry of this beast into our long-term care homes. Response. Every government has been responsible for ignoring long-term care. We are changing that. Our government will make a difference for long-term care. A supplementary question. 
Well, it seems the Premier thinks a government-controlled commission is good enough for Ontarians. But for everyday Ontarians like Ramona Cole, they tell us that the only way we'll get to a bottom, the bottom of what happened in long-term care homes is through a full, independent public inquiry. Ramona has been calling for an inquiry into long-term care since 2017. It's unfortunate when the Liberals had the chance, they didn't call a full, broad public inquiry into long-term care, unfortunately. Uh, but what uh, uh, what Ramona says is this, and I quote, heroic frontline workers are overworked and underpaid, but without a public inquiry, our overworked heroes will go back to the status of overworked unsung heroes. Please do Washington. the right thing. Will the government listen to people like Ramona and ensure that all the voices of Ontarians are heard in a full, independent public inquiry? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. It is Personal Support Worker Day, and I want to make sure that they are acknowledged in the way that is necessary for the efforts that they have made valiantly on the front lines of long-term care. Our long-term care homes have been the front lines. And if we look at the pandemic pay that we brought forward to recognize their efforts above and beyond what anybody should have to go through. We recognize the importance of personal support workers and all staff serving on the front lines. We have recognized and acknowledged that. And the measures that we have taken, looking at COVID-19, the, the damage that it's done to our long-term care system, we have addressed the staffing issues. We have an expert panel looking into this as we speak to provide and inform us how to move forward after COVID-19. Response? COVID-19 has broken long-term care. Our government is fixing it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Flamborough. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Premier, many of my constituents are grateful for all of the hard work, sacrifice, and dedication from our frontline workers. Because of their actions, we continue to see fewer and fewer cases being reported and more individuals recovering. Last week, our government had some positive news about how the province will slowly ease restriction, allowing for more businesses to open while ensuring health and safety standards are maintained. Speaker, can the Premier share with the Legislature what today's Phase 1 reopening means for my constituents and the rest of the province? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the member from Flamborough, Glenbrook, for a question. We're getting thousands of people back to work. We laid a solid foundation for economic reopening and recovery. We have the framework, we have the workplace safety guidelines, we have the capacity in our health care system, but most of all, Mr. Speaker, we have some of the most talented people anywhere in the world right here in Ontario. And as of today, we are entering a new stage, stage one of reopening of our province. We can reopen retail stores with street entrants that are not located in shopping malls with strict social distancing measures in place. This includes other seasonal venues like outdoor sports fields, certain health and medical services, and the lifting of essential construction limits to allow construction Bons? to resume. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Premier, this is excellent news and shows how Ontario's steady, scientific-based approach is working. I know that many of my constituents will be happy about the reopening of seasonal venues during this time, including outdoor sports fields, tennis courts, and off-leash dog parks as people are becoming active. Further, the restarting of critical construction projects demonstrates the continued importance of infrastructure projects that will serve the people of this province. Premier, please share with the Legislature how our government will ensure that health and safety is protected while still being able to reopen the economy. The Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook. I want to be clear that businesses should open only if they're ready. And I'll repeat that, only if they're ready. If you aren't ready, then don't open. Ontario's labour laws are clear. Businesses must protect the health and safety of their workers and customers. 
Our inspectors are visiting workplaces to ensure everything is being done to keep workers safe, and through our great Minister of Labour, have compiled over 90 guidelines for different workplaces. If we follow the medical advice, if we take our time and get it right, then we'll be able to open more businesses, get people back to work where they want to get to. Mr. Speaker, we have a long way to go. We have a long road to recovery, but let's take some time today Response. and be grateful for how far we've all come. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Families with loved ones in care have been clear. The crisis we are seeing in long-term care demands a full public inquiry. I know the Premier has received letters from families across Ontario, including ones from veterans and family councils in long-term care homes across Ontario. Rick McElstrom is a family council chair at Henley Place Long-Term Care, which saw an outbreak of COVID-19 last March. He writes, quote, as a member of a family council of long-term care home hit hard by COVID-19, I know that families like mine want to know why our loved ones have been put at risk by COVID-19 and, frankly, the realities of Ontario's broken long-term care system. I am urging you today to support a full public inquiry into long-term care in Ontario." End quote. Will the Premier Should support Rick's request? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply for the government. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians do have questions, and they deserve to be answered. And that's exactly what we're doing with an independent commission that will be non-partisan. And from the outset of this pandemic, our government has been decisive. We have acted swiftly and responsibly. We have created a number of measures to support our long-term care homes, including bringing in the Canadian Armed Forces, integrating hospital infection prevention and control teams, rapid response teams into our homes to help with staffing. We've issued over three emergency orders, uh, two amendments to regulations to provide important aspects to staffing flexibility. And some of the decisions have been very hard, including the essential visitors only. We've taken measure after measure after measure to defend our loved ones in long-term care homes. We've done it consistently. Response. And even before, as soon as we were a dedicated ministry, we were looking to reform and rebuild long-term care. This is ongoing. Our government will persist. The supplementary question. Speaker, I hope this government will actually listen to the calls on this House for a full public inquiry. If this is not the time, I don't know when is. Rick is far from alone. Anna Tremblay writes, quote, as a member of the Catholic Women's League of Canada, I urge you to launch a public inquiry to examine conditions and problems in, pre in the present system. If there's one thing we've learned during this pandemic is that the most vulnerable people in our society need protection, end quote. The Reverend Dr. Peter Vank of Markham writes, quote, I have personally been involved with care homes for many years as a volunteer, primarily as a visitor of practitioners. I have watched the continued deterioration of care despite the dedication and efforts of the many staff. There needs to be a comprehensive evaluation provided by a public inquiry." End quote. Question. Speaker, will the Premier heed the words and commit to a full public inquiry today? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I want to acknowledge long-term care and the quality of care that needs to be provided across Ontario for our loved ones. As a family doctor, over 30 years ago, I started in long-term care. I know the sector well. I've lived it personally as well with my own family members. I know how important it is for people to have the care that they need when they need it. And that's why our government is looking to address questions surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic with an independent commission that is non-partisan. There is a sense of urgency. We must keep reforming, rebuilding, and advancing long-term care that has been so badly neglected for decades. This has been building for decades. And now COVID hits, and it has broken our system. We will rebuild it. We will reform it. Response. We will move long-term care forward for each and every Ontarian who deserves the high-quality care that Ontario can provide. Here, here. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker, and I too want to acknowledge our personal support workers on this uh, day of acknowledgement. I know how hard they're working on the front lines, and some have even given their lives during this pandemic. I, my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, our long-term care system is in crisis, and the Minister herself has said that COVID has broken this system. But despite the government's promise and commitment to put an iron ring around long-term care, there have been unacceptable delays to the actions taken by the government, and there have been gaps in the response. And this has resulted in avoidable deaths, whether it's those who are working on the front lines or the residents that reside there during COVID-19. And the government has said time and time again that they are responding. And yet, since I asked my first question on March question. the 11th, for restricted access to these facilities. Those actions continue to be delayed. My question today is, will you use the power that you've granted yourself to take over those facilities that are currently in outbreak so that we can- Thank you very much. Minister of Long-Term Care. Well, we have acted swiftly and decisively. As early as February 3rd, bringing guidance to protect and contain long uh, uh, COVID-19 in long-term care homes. We acted Every few days, there was an, an action. This was throughout uh, the process in the last few months. So we have acted decisively on this. And, and I would ask you know, the opposition and, and the members sitting across, where were you on February 3rd and after? You didn't raise, raise a single question after the House returned on COVID-19. On co no, not between February 8th, uh, 18th and 21st. So where was the opposition? Where were you? So I'm saying to you, we all have a responsibility to make sure that our residents in long-term care get the support that they need. We, we have an emergency order that will be used to support homes in crises when needed, and it, it will be used if needed. Thank you. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, I, I'm very shocked at uh, the response from the minister. And just to check answer on March 11th, I asked this government to put restrictions on access to long term care to keep those who are residing there safe. That was asked. And, you know, it's, it's not about at this stage pointing fingers. It's about taking decisive action. It's about doing what is required to keep people in those homes safe. And if you see an issue that needs to be resolved, I urge you to take immediate and decisive action. This government has put aside a billion dollars for COVID response. Utilize those resources that are available to you to save lives. The dignity of the people who reside in those settings deserve it. Question. And my question to you is, will the government go beyond an internal review that you can control to do a full, transparent and independent public inquiry so that the families and... Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. And to the member opposite, if I in fact have misinformation on that, I apologize to you. Um, so I appreciate what you're bringing forward. I would have to say that we have acted decisively and swiftly through all of this. This is a global pandemic moving swiftly across the world, affecting our seniors and our elderly uh, in long-term care at a devastating rate. Ontario is not alone in this. This is happening across the world, across the country, and we are taking decisive action, and we have from the very beginning we have taken measure after measure. Our government has acted swiftly and decisively. It is a new virus. The science is emerging. It will continue to evolve. And that is not politics. That is science. So we have to make sure we continue to take action. Response. And we will do that. A public inquiry will slow our action. It will delay our reforms. We need a sense of urgency. Thank you. Next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. To the uh, Minister of Health, uh, in February, I asked uh, if the minister 
would commit to negotiating an agreement with the pharmaceutical firm Vertex for life-saving cystic fibrosis medication. Since that time, a lot has happened that, frankly, has only made the situation worse and even more dire for patients. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that affects the lungs and breathing, much like COVID, the COVID-19 virus. Catching COVID-19 would be a death sentence for children like the two young boys of Jamie and Sasha LaRock, who live in my riding. Speaker, the government has put billions into this pandemic to help people suffering from breathing issues. Why won't the government give the same consideration to cystic fibrosis patients who are presumably at much greater risk of complications if they contract COVID-19? The Minister of Health to reply. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. I know this has been important to you for a number of years, and you've been a very strong advocate for uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. But we also take this situation very, very seriously. And we know that when there's new emerging drug technologies coming forward, that patients are very anxious about that, especially with more rare uh, disease conditions or health conditions. And so it's, uh, it's even more important that some of these solutions come forward. And we have been working on that. We have not given up on the uh, challenge that uh, patients with cystic fibrosis face. So we have been working with Vertex, the manufacturer of the three uh, major drugs being used for cystic fibrosis or to be used for that purpose, or can be, Simdeco and Jocafta. What uh, we have had meetings recently in March and even into April with Vertex, Response. with our provincial, feder federal and territorial partners, uh, but we understand that the recent offer Vertex presented does not address the concerns that were raised by the uh, pan-Canadian pharmaceutical. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I'm glad to hear you're at least at the table with, uh, with Vertex and appreciate that on behalf of CF patients. You mentioned the drug Orcambi, which is available at this time and approved, uh, made by the same company. But as you know, the prescribing criteria that your ministry has attached to this medication is so cumbersome that not a single Ontario cystic fibrosis patient has ever had access to our CAMBI because of the prescribing criteria. So I ask you today on behalf of those patients who would benefit greatly, particularly during this time of the virus, the COVID-19 virus, since your ministry put the criteria on, clearly your ministry has the power to loosen that criteria and give, it, give cystic fibrosis patients uh, access to our CAMBI, a drug that we all agree is essentially a miracle drug for these patients. Um, I'd ask you to loosen Question. that criteria today and, and let those patients breathe and breathe freely. Minister of Health. Well, thank you. We uh, continue to review the criteria, but there's also the fact that the offer that Vertex put forward uh, didn't satisfy the uh, Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. And while that's disappointing, of course, we're continuing our negotiations with Vertex with respect to that issue. We also want to make sure that they can bring their other drugs forward as well, that we understand that Simdeco has not yet been submitted to CADIS, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health for approval, and Trichafta has not yet been submitted for Health Canada approval. So there's still many steps that Vertex needs to take, but we recognize that we need to continue to do our work as well, because we know that the health of many young people in particular with cystic fibrosis uh, depend upon that. So notwithstanding all of the work that we're doing for COVID-19, we're not letting those current concerns sit aside. We're continuing to work on them. Response. We hope that we will have a response from Vertex very soon that's going to satisfy this, the criteria that they're put to. The next question, the member for Tamiskaman Cochrane. My question is to the Premier. The Premier and the Minister of Health stated last week that Ontario has been a national and international leader per capita COVID-19 testing. The data shows something else. Yesterday, Ontario finished just 9,155 9, tests, less than half of the Premier's own target. Today's numbers are even lower. 5,813. Wow. The province lags behind the Northwest Territories, Alberta and Nova Scotia on a per capita basis. That's not a national leader. Worldwide, the United States is completing more per capita testing than Ontario. Why has the Premier said Ontario's per capita testing is world leading when the data shows otherwise? 
Minister of Health to reply. The Premier has said that our testing capacity is world-leading because it's actually true. I think that people of Ontario need to know that Ontario is the, the leader in Canada for testing. And we have seen the changes that week to week there is always a lag on Mondays, days, volumes for Tuesday because of some of the issues with transportation, with couriers, and so on. That doesn't mean that we're falling behind. In fact, we've met our testing capacity 91 per cent of the time. We're continuing to increase testing. We've expanded our lab capacity besides the work that's being done by Public Health Ontario. We've included it to over 22 partners with university labs, hospital labs, and private labs being included. And we know that this is really important as we open up the economy, that testing is going to continue to be very important. Response. And as I said before, Ontario is the leader in Canada in testing now. The supplementary question. The government's own initial target was 18,900 tests per day by mid-April. Not once in April did the government meet that target. And since that, since that target was to be met, Ontario averaged less than 13,000 tests a day. Testing targets are important because they allow public health officials to trace where this virus is spread in the community and to try to stop its spread. Ontario, Ontario should be leading the country with tests. There's no reason why we're not. In Alberta, their government has injected further funding into their public lab system to ensure their testing capacity is increased. Why isn't Ontario meeting its own testing targets, and what has caused Ontario's lag? Is it funding, is it a lack of testing equipment, or something else? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, as I've indicated, Ontario is leading Canada in terms of testing. We have exceeded the capacity. We had over 19,000 tests. We continue to have tests um, other than on Mondays, for the reasons which I've already explained, with a significant number of tests, which we know are going to have to continue. And Ontario did make $100 million available through our action plan in additional investments for public health units to support COVID-19 testing, including funding to support support enhanced contact tracing as well. So we know that what we need to do is continue our testing of vulnerable populations. We have completed our testing of all long-term care residents and staff. We are now moving into testing residents of retirement homes, group homes, other places of congregate living, including shelters. We also are making sure if we, if we've expanded our testing so that if someone is symptomatic Response. and comes to one of our assessment centers, they will be tested. And we also need to increase our surveillance testing in the general population as we open the economy so we can determine the effects of the opening on our public health generally. We continue to do that. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, for my question, I'd like to personally thank the Premier and the Minister of Health for directing the government to collect COVID-19 race-based data. I know there's a lot of people out there that appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last week you released the government's plan to reopen the economy. As a result, parents have been calling my office concerned about how do they, how do they return to work while their kids are still at home. Through you, Mr. Speaker, does the Premier have a plan to help parents with childcare, or at least some alternative, so they can participate in opening up our economy. Thank you. Recognize the Minister of Education to reply on behalf of the government. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you, Member Opposite, for the question. Obviously, we appreciate full well, Speaker, the importance of child care and home care to enable parents to return to the labour market. Uh, later today, the Premier, the Deputy Premier, and I will be making an announcement on the future of keeping kids safe while they learn at home. That will include components dealing with child care. What I could confirm to the member is that we're proud that over 1,600 students every day are receiving emergency child care in this province uh, to support our frontline heroes and workers uh, making a difference in COVID-19. Our expectation is child care will reopen over time, subject to strict public health guidance to ensure we keep these children safe in this province. The supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, even before the pandemic began, we were facing a child care crisis here in Ontario, both in terms of cost and space available. And with social distancing guidelines in place, we will see less capacity within the sector. This will put our province's economic recovery in jeopardy, as many parents will not be able to return to work. 
Premier, many, other, many Ontarians will be forced to choose between staying at home with their kids or letting the bills continue to pile up. Opening up the economy must include massive planning, investment, and expansion of publicly funded childcare. So, Speaker, what is the Premier's plan, and who, will he direct his government to invest resources into creating more childcare spaces so parents can get back to work? The Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite again for the question. Uh, Speaker, just when it comes to enabling uh, our economic recovery, obviously we want to make sure the sustainability of the childcare sector. And I'm proud that in partnership with the federal government, with Minister Ahmed Hussein, we have landed a, I think, positive plan that's going to help ensure these operators remain strong and that these childcare spaces remain accessible to parents. We're doing that through providing the rent subsidy, which the province is, is participating 37 per cent in that investment for those operators that participate. We're also also ensuring the federal wage subsidy has been expanded to include child care operators. And at the Ministry of Education, we've expanded our operating support uh, to enable some additional support for those operators dealing with enhanced uh, cost, uh, fixed costs in the province of Ontario. Speaker, that's going to ensure the system is strong. When it comes to parents, we put an emergency order that denies operators from charging them for a service not rendered. That was important from a consumer protection perspective. And when it comes to money in the parent pockets Response. of parents, $200 per child under 12, $250 per child under 21 in the pockets of every working parent in this province to help them get through this difficult time. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Yes, Monsieur le Président, my question is for the Premier Minister. I'm quoting. It's so frustrating hearing that the frontline people are having problems getting the PPE. Those are words from the Premier, and I agree. In my constituency of Nickel Belt, I've been contacted by a chiropodist, occupational therapist, physiotherapist, nurses, family physician, PSWs, the list goes on. All of them continue to say that they cannot get PPE, that they are not properly protected to do their job. And workers in long-term care homes across the province are still struggling to access PPE that are either kept under lock and key or are not available at all. Why? Have frontline staff or healthcare heroes not been provided the personal protective equipment to protect them from the spread of COVID-19? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. This is vitally important. We do have frontline healthcare heroes that go to work each and every day, including our personal support workers whose day we're celebrating today. We want to make sure that they are protected both for themselves as well as for their families when they go home. So we want to make sure that they have the personal protective equipment that they need to continue to do their great work, which we do have. Despite an international um, surge in, in demand for PPE, we are still placing our regular orders. We're placing new orders wherever we can, and we're working with some great Ontario companies that are able to produce these uh, pieces of equipment, including gowns, hand sanitizer, ventilators, masks, and other support equipment. We want to make sure that they have it on the front lines. We're going to continue to do that despite the, uh, the demand, Response. because that's the very least that we can do for them. They are doing all of the work for us. It's our duty, and it's something that the Premier and I and many other members of government are working on on a daily basis to get more PPE to send to our front line. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Too many health care and other essential workers had to beg to get the proper PPE at work. The Premier has asked people to call him. Speaker, there has to be a better solution than demanding frontline workers take time away from their job of caring for us to be on hold with the Premier's office to get the PPE that they need. Now that other areas of the economy is opening up, the risk for workers to go without proper PPE is even greater. The Premier and the Minister insist that appropriate PPE is available. Then how can they explain that? Why? Are frontline healthcare workers still telling me that they are struggling to gain access to PPE? And why are so many workers getting infected, getting sick, and dying? Minister of Health. 
Well, it is vitally important that our frontline health care workers have the appropriate level of PPE to wear, depending on what procedure they are going through. If it's an aerosol-generating procedure, they will need an N95 mask. We know that. There are other procedures that will require that, too. That said, we have a system for delivery to hospitals, long-term care homes, retirement homes. If they need PPE, which they give us on a daily inventory, it is sent to them. They have it. Whether they use it or not in some of those centres is a different question, and we've had a situation where we have had hospitals that have gone in to assist some of these long-term care homes with um, providing the uh, infection pr procedures and control, in some cases providing staff members because some people have fallen ill or they're just not coming in because they're afraid of falling ill. So we need to make sure that we figure out why that's not Response. happening. The hospitals are in there doing their work, and they are coming in oftentimes with their own supply of PPE to make sure that their workers are protected as well as the mm -hmm. existing workers are protected. So that is one of the questions that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetano. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. First Nations and Kiwetanuk have been, long, uh, been, um, been doing everything possible to uh, keep COVID-19 uh, out of the communities. They've gone through great lengths to keep communities safe, uh, such as implementing strict lockdowns and travel restrictions. But this government needs to do more. This government needs to do more to remedy the issues. Uh, that uh, to make First Nations more. Uh, to make uh, First Nations people more vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 in the first place, such as uh, overcrowding of homes, access to clean drinking water, and uh, lack of hospitals. How is this government working with the, uh, the First Nations on dealing with this pandemic? Minister of Health to reply on behalf of the government. The member very much for the question. You're absolutely right that uh, many First Nations communities and, and some Indigenous communities are very vulnerable to COVID-19 for a whole variety of reasons. But um, they, uh, First Nations communities have been identified by us at the Ministry of Health as being a group of people that need to uh, we need to work with to make sure that the uh, that they receive the necessary supplies, the nesting, necessary testing kits, and so on. My colleague, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs has been working very hard on this, as we have with the Ministry of Health. We have been on a number of phone calls with um, the uh, regional chief, Roseanne Archibald, and as well as some of the other leaders to understand what the needs are and to make sure that those needs are met. I know that my colleague, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, actually, uh, when he flew north to Kenora, the last response. time he took a plane load of equipment in response to the needs that were expressed to him. So I'll explain more in my supplemental. Thank you. The supplementary question. Um, it's clear uh, that the current situation uh, uh, poses a risk to the health of the, our communities in the north, and that it's higher than the risks faced by most people in Ontario. Agencies and uh, leadership in the north have a great deal of advice that this government should actually listen to on how and when the North should be reopened. Once the North is uh, open uh, up again, uh, the second wave of, uh, of COVID-19 could spread to First Nations across the North. What is the government doing to listen and support communities in planning for that possibility? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and it's good to see the member opposite uh, again after uh, 10 weeks. Um, and thank you for bringing this question to us. Our government has acted, and, and we acted quickly, uh, to meet the needs of those in our Indigenous uh, communities and working with the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Mr. Rickford, uh, who, who uh, is doing great work in the communities, as the Minister of Health has alluded to. Uh, on April 7th, we were able to announce $37 million in funding uh, that was going to support outbreak planning in those northern and rural and remote communities, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that money is being spent to provide uh, prevention 
prevention and mitigation uh, efforts in those communities and ensure the health and well-being of those Indigenous people and those communities at this particular time, particularly um, those in those remote and uh, northern communities that need the assistance. So uh, acting together across ministries with social assistance Response. and with the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and the Minister of Housing, we were able to provide that funding to those vulnerable communities. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. And I want to start by thanking all the PSWs who are out there working hard on the front lines every day, caring for the people that we care for most. I, I want to begin the question, uh, this question by saying we all have questions here. I know you have questions on the other side. And I know we've announced, or you've announced, an independent commission inquiry. I just would like to remind this House that the last independent commission of inquiry, both the FAO and the Auditor General called some of those results into question. That can't happen this time. Nobody can question the results of an inquiry. We owe that to families. We owe that to workers. We must ensure judicial independence. We need to get those questions answered. You have the same questions. I know you care the same amount, but we can't do a half measure. Question. So, Speaker, I respectfully ask on behalf of families that the Premier reconsider and call a public inquiry. Yeah. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you for the question. Ontario families and residents of long-term care on wait lists, let's call them on wait lists because they're not actually in long-term care, 37,000 people on the wait list and growing. And that has been growing for years and years and years. We need to understand how we can move forward in, with a sense of urgency. Delaying our reforms and delaying the advancement of long-term care um, solutions will only mean more people waiting for care more people not being able to access the care they need. We've seen the inaction by the previous government for 15 years. We have seen the inaction and the, the lack of, of interest in COVID-19 from the opposition when it first began. Our government understands what needs addressing. We have learned from COVID-19. We understand the issues. A nonpartisan, independent commission Response. will give us the best opportunity to provide the solutions and create the change that is needed for Ontarians across. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. That was a disappointing response, Mr. Speaker. So, I don't understand the reluctance to allow judicial independence to look at our response. Because it's not just about the decisions that you made over here, or maybe we made over there. But it's other people who made those decisions outside of us that we live with. You know that. We, we, can do, we can walk and chew gum, folks. We can walk and chew gum. We can have a commission, and we can have an independent inquiry. Nothing prevents us from doing that. We owe that to people. There are you, I know you have questions, and you're not going to ask them out here, but you have questions in your head about why did we do this, and why didn't we do that, and why did this happen? under your watch, under our watch, under everybody's. That's why we have to do it. Question. It's for those families, that independence is critical. So again, I ask the Premier, please reconsider. Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care, reply. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank you again for the question. What's truly disappointing is the neglect of the long-term care system for 15 long years. That wait list grew. That wait list grew to the tens of thousands under the watch Official of the opposition come to order. government. So what I am truly disappointed in is the neglect Independent members of come the to order. previous government. What we need to be doing is clear. We need to be addressing the shortcomings in long-term care, and that's exactly what we will be doing. When you ask for a delay for a public inquiry for years, you are asking to add to your legacy of neglect, and I do not accept that. We will move forward with long-term care, getting people the care that they need when they need it, and we will Response. do it with a commitment that your government never had. Yeah, yeah. 
Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Anne Tran owns Ba Noi, a restaurant in my riding. He is a new business owner and he has invested everything into his business. Before the pandemic hit, Ba Noi was closed for construction, but because of this crisis, they still haven't been able to open. Anne's family has a new baby, and they're worried that if they don't get the support this government has promised was on the way, they'll have to close for good. Businesses like Ba Noi are falling through the cracks and can't wait any longer. Why won't this government do the right thing and give businesses the direct financial support they deserve? Minister Finance to reply. Speaker, I thank, thank the member for the question, uh, and I do thank the, the uh, opposition party for its newfound interest in, in small business and business. I know, I know that that community will appreciate it. Mr. Speaker, as you know, this legislature passed $10 billion in support. That included $6 billion in support related to deferrals of taxes, $1.8 billion in regard to property taxes that we enabled municipalities to do, $1.9 billion in WSIB supports. We also, Mr. Speaker, cut the taxes that uh, the tax of the or the employer health tax by $355 million, so 90 per cent of those businesses won't pay that tax this year. Mr. Speaker, we also reduced electricity costs by $300 for each business each month. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that understands the needs of business. Mr. Speaker, we are pleased that the federally sponsored program that has been endorsed by all the provinces, that we over a billion dollars in rent support, will be coming online. We understand Response. that information will be made available this month. And, Mr. Speaker, that is the kind of support that small businesses is asking for, and it's the kind of support that they've come to expect from this government. Thank you. Member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Omega Health and Fitness is a family-owned business which employs 30 people and provides services to patients, seniors, and people with mobility issues, actively reducing the number of people who need to visit the hospitals. Their landlord has been unwilling to negotiate and has refused to pay to apply for the CECRA program. They have now had to maximize their line of credits to pay the last two months' rent and are worried they may not be able to uh, pay the next month's rent. Mr. Speaker, many other businesses are facing the exact same reality as Omega Health and Fitness. This government's lack of action resulted in many of these businesses to be evicted or threatened with eviction. Mr. Speaker, too many businesses have already shut down. Too many families have already lost their livelihoods. We cannot lose any more. Will this government commit to issuing a moratorium on business evictions now? Minister of Finance again. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for the question. And again, uh, I know that businesses everywhere will be pleased next time we suggest a tax cut for small businesses, which we did, or next time we reduce regulations for small businesses, which we've done, that, that your side will, will support those as well, because that's important to business. Mr. Speaker, um, what we have done, and, and as the Premier has talked about, is in a prudent and safe way, Mr. Speaker, presented our framework for reopening businesses. So in addition to the sports I talked about, in addition to the rent support, which will be over a billion dollars for businesses in Ontario, we have found a, ca a safe and a sensible way to gradually open businesses like the ones that you've spoken of. So, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to getting those businesses open when it's safe in working with the, the science and, and best health advice. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support small businesses as we always have. Thank you. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. During this pandemic, I know that some of my constituents in Burlington and across this province have experienced some food and product shortages. Whether it was reports of shortage of dis disinfecting wipes, toilet paper, or now increased demands for flour, yeast, and sugar in our food sector. Premier, I know that these shortages are top of mind for you, like many individuals in our government. Premier, can you share with the legislature what our government is doing to ensure that the people of Ontario will be able to continue to have access to the food and supplies that their families need during this time? Question is to the Premier. I want to thank the, the great member from, from Burlington for all the great work she's doing out there. Uh, last, last, last week, Mr. Speaker, I had a phone call with the consumer goods and in the food supply chain companies, some of the largest in, in the country. Uh, they've been working around the clock to keep up with demand. They've been adding shifts, new lines to keep up with the demand on some of the critical items. Uh, people enjoy baking now, Mr. Speaker, so flour is going off the shelves quick, yeast, 
and uh, hand sanitizers and other items. But after speaking to him, uh, I'm, I'm happy to announce that we have an, enough essential items. When we go into the store, we can't be, be you know, clearing the shelves and putting in our basket. We got to be respectful to one another. When you're when you're buying the toilet paper, maybe you get one pack instead of two. But even the tissue companies are telling me they have more than enough capacity. We just have to respect each other when we're going. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Premier, thank you for that answer and for your continued commitment and hard work to ensuring the people of this province have the supplies they need. I want to take the opportunity to personally thank and commend the hardworking members of the agricultural community who are the backbone of our province's enormous and complex supply chain system. Here, here. They are on the front lines each day, ensuring we have food on our tables and we have the products we need in our day-to-day -day lives that keep us healthy and connected, Speaker. Speaker, through you, can the Premier elaborate on the support our government is continuing to provide to this sector going forward? Premier. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I want to thank the, the member from Burlington. I know that many of our farmers out there are struggling. I had a conversation with uh, many farmers last week with our great Minister uh, of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, what I hear is they need help, and they have an ally and a champion in our government. What we need support, we need support from the federal government. Organizations like the grain farmers, they're, they're in desperate need. When we see what's happening south of our border in the United States, when the, the, the grain farmers are getting $19 billion from their federal government, it puts, puts us on an unfair uh, competition. So what we're going to do, we're going to support our farmers, but we can't do it alone, Mr. Speaker. We need the support of the federal government, and I've put a Response. call out to the federal government to support our farmers, our salt of the earth. Thank you. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.